At noon of the 7th of October 1571, an Ottoman fleet of more than 250 ships clashed with the fleet of the Holy League in the Gulf of Petros, about 13 miles from the naval base of Lepanto. To the fore of the Christian Armada were four heavy galleasses, firing one volley after another, thereby wreaking havoc among the Ottoman galleys. Nonetheless, the Ottoman Grand Admiral Muezzin Sade Ali Pasha ordered his ships forward directly into the fire. He was determined to win the battle, no matter what. The Battle of Lepanto had just begun. Lepanto was one of the greatest naval battles of the Mediterranean, and the last one to be fought almost exclusively by rowing vessels. According to the maritime historian Lawrence Mott, a staggering amount of 70 to 90 percent of all war galleys in the basin participated in the fighting. Lepanto was in some sense the naval counterpart of the 1683 Siege of Vienna. Contemporaries and historians long saw it as a climactic battle between East and West, and mythologized it as the battle in which a Christian fleet defeated the seemingly unstoppable Ottoman threat from the East. In this video, we're going to look at what exactly happened in the Gulf of Petros, and look critically at the impact the battle really had. Just as critically should you look at your internet security. For that, we recommend you check out the dark web monitor of NordVPN, the sponsor of today's video. A lot of hacking could be prevented, for example keyloggers, which is a type of malware that tracks every click on your keyboard and sends the info to the hacker. So, if you have entered your credential with a keylogger running in the background of your device, it gets sent to the keylogger owner. An easy fix is using websites that list email addresses that have been listed on the dark web, such as haveibeenpwned.com, and tools such as Nord's dark web monitor to get alerted in case your device or your email address might be compromised. It is also recommended to use a password manager like NordPass to generate strong unique passwords. Using a password manager comes with the nice side effect that you don't have to remember them anymore. NordVPN also comes with a threat protection feature that keeps malicious websites, annoying trackers and irritating advertisements at bay. Get Nord for the price of a cup of coffee per month by clicking on the link in the description below. All of this is entirely risk-free thanks to Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. In the 16th century, the Ottoman Empire expanded westward, both on land and sea. By the middle of the century, it firmly controlled the eastern Mediterranean and Barbary corsairs in Ottoman service roamed the western part of the Mediterranean Sea, raiding the coasts of Catalonia and Calabria, for example. The Catholic powers in Western Europe felt increasingly threatened, but were unable to put an end to the Ottoman advance. Although they achieved minor successes here and there, the Ottoman Empire seemed almost unstoppable. This belief was nurtured in 1560, when a counter-strike by Philip II of Spain and his allies failed miserably and their fleet was devastated near the island of Djerba. Five years later, an Ottoman invasion of Malta, a strategic stepping stone to mainland Europe, could be stopped, which was perceived as averting a calamity in the very last moment. From then on, Pope Pius V was relentlessly trying to rally the Catholic powers to stop the Ottoman threat with united forces as everyone was occupied with their own problems, or was even at peace with the Eastern power, he had little success. This changed when the Ottomans broke their peace with Venice and invaded Cyprus in 1570. They quickly took control of the island and by 1571 only Famagusta stood defiant. Venice, who had long hoped to preserve its trading empire by bargaining with the Ottomans, now joined the Pope's effort and after much convincing and drawn-out negotiations, Spain, Venice, Genoa and the Papal States, alongside several other Catholic powers, formed the Holy League. They wanted to relieve Famagusta, reconquer Cyprus and end the Ottoman advance in the Mediterranean. Sultan Selim II, called the Sot, meanwhile decided to use the momentum from conquering Cyprus to advance into the Adriatic for good. While the forces of the Holy League were preparing slowly, his Grand Admiral, Muezzin Sade Ali Pasha, moved into the Adriatic quickly, captured Sopoto, Durazzo and then proceeded north to lay siege to Cattaro. At the end of August, the Ottomans, who were well aware of the Holy League's preparations, retreated to Corfu to regroup. As would become clear later, they were on their way to their naval base at Lepanto.
The fleet of the Catholic ships trickling into the harbour of Messina between the 20th of July and the 23rd of August was under the superior command of a young man who despite his inexperience was admired by his soldiers and was held in great esteem by his fellow commanders, Don John of Austria. The 24-year-old illegitimate son of Emperor Charles V and half-brother of Philip II of Spain. Don John's command had been one of the conditions of Spain, who was contributing the lion's share of the funds. The second in command was Marc Antonio Colonna, the admiral of the papal fleet. Typical for Christian alliances, the Holy League's fleet was wrecked with this agreement. This would prove the most significant issue for John of Austria. On the 16th of September, the fleet weighed anchor and left the harbour of Messina. It arrived on Corfu 10 days later. Even now, a disagreement among the Allies almost led to a fight. The Venetians were contributing more ships than anybody else, but had been badly affected by the war against the Ottomans in the previous year. So they had to fill their ranks with Spanish soldiers. The Venetian general of the sea, Sebastiano Venier, however, felt embarrassed to accept Spanish help. He also disagreed with Don John's proceedings and became increasingly disaffected. On the 2nd of October, this tinderbox exploded. Gian Andrea Doria, a Genoese admiral, came to inspect the Venetian ships. This made Venier's blood boil, because the Venetians deeply despised Doria, who was, in their opinion, largely responsible for the failure of an attempt to relieve Cyprus the year before. As if this had not been enough, an argument between Spanish soldiers and the crew of a Venetian galley escalated. When the general of the sea sent some of his subordinates to resolve the dispute, the response was so violent that two of his officers died from their wounds. Venier, fuming and not intending to tolerate such things on his ships, hanged the captain of the three responsible soldiers without consulting Don John of Austria. After that, tensions ran even higher. Don John saw this as a severe interference with his powers. He even wanted to attack the Venetians, seize Venier and hang him on a yardarm right away if it wasn't for the sagacious counsel of Marc Antonio Colonna. Venier's galleys would be bitterly needed soon. Ultimately, the Venetian commander was punished by exclusion from the council of war. With this sorted out, the fleet continued its journey and sailed to Preveza and then to Zante, where they expected to find the Ottoman fleet. On the 4th of October, while anchoring in Fiscardo, they first heard of the shocking news. Cyprus had fallen. After a long siege, Famagusta had surrendered to Laula Mustafa Pasha, who had then broken the terms of surrender, captured most of the Christian soldiers as galley slaves, killed many and flayed the leader of the defense, Marc Antonio Bragadin, alive. Again, quarreling broke out. Many believed the cause was lost and the fleet should return. But Don John was ardent to seek out the Ottoman Armada and in the end the fleet continued in its journey south. On dawn of the 7th of October 1571, the lookouts spotted armed vessels at the mouth of the Gulf of Patras. As the daylight brightened, it revealed the Ottoman Armada, which had left their base at Lepanto the last night. Neither of the fleet had a strategic objective there, but both chose to engage probably because both expected an easy victory. According to the historian Jan Glint, Ali Pasha had received an immediate order to attack, and Don John wanted to fight before his quarrelsome subordinates could again pounce at each other. Now it seems that the commanders of the Holy League finally decided to fight the Ottomans rather than each other. Mir Zinzade Ali Pasha had left the safety of the Gulf of Corinth and entered the arena of battle, the Gulf of Patras, from the east. The fleet of the League came from the northwest, entering the Gulf between the island of Oxia and the mainland promontory of Skrofa. As soon as they caught sight of the Ottomans, they drew up in battle order. For once, contemporary accounts pretty much agree on the size of the two fleets. The Ottomans had about 250 to 275 ships most of them galleys, but also some 50 to 60 smaller galliots. All in all, 30,000 Ottoman soldiers were sailing to battle. They were numerically superior in regards to the number of ships, but their ships were smaller and carried fewer cannons on average. Don John had a total of about 35,000 soldiers on 206 galleys and 6 galleasses, which are larger ships combining the seaworthiness of the sailing ship with the firepower of a galley. 
with guns on all four sides, they resembled swimming fortresses. These would become his trump card. While the Ottoman navy was arrayed in a shallow half moon, planning to outflank their enemy, the ships of the Holy League only slowly passed around Skrofa and spread out to full formation. Interestingly, the scouts of both parties had underestimated the enemy's strength. Kenneth M. Seton, an expert on Ottoman-European relations, explains that the Ottomans expected no more than 150 galleys with quarreling leaders. Only when the Holy League fleet had spread to full array at around 8 am did they realize that the numbers estimated by Karakoza Ali, who had led the scouting mission, were far from accurate. Doubts were now arising, but after some discussions the Ottomans decided to engage, nevertheless. The Holy League's main force, commanded by John of Austria, Colonna and Venier, moved into place first. Its 60-odd galleys faced off against the Ottoman center under Muezzin Sade Ali Pasha and Pertau Pasha, the commander of the soldiers. Next appeared Gian Andrea Doria, who positioned himself to the south of the main force, forming the right wing. Facing Doria was Uluj Ali, a former privateer who had quickly risen through the ranks. At last, Agostino Barbarigo came around the promontory to take the left wing, close to the Albanian shore and vis-a-vis -vis Mehmed Siroko, the governor of Alexandria. Each of the Holy League's divisions had two galleasses, who would take the front and act as juggernauts to shoot breaches into the Ottoman lines. Behind the center of both fleets waited a reserve of some 30 galleys, ready to fill in any gap and strengthen weakened segments in the lines of battle. As was common at the time, both fleets fought in line abreast, that is, side by side facing the enemy. Don John had taken two very effective measures before the battle. Firstly, he had the prows removed or reduced so that they could shoot at a flatter angle. This added to the fact that the Holy League generally outgunned the Ottomans. Secondly, and more importantly, he had not assigned all the ships according to their origin. So, the right wing was for example made up mostly of Doria's ship from Genoa, Naples and Sicily, but also several vessels from Venice, Candia, Corfu and the Papal States. This was meant to weld the armada together. Soon, both fleets had taken battle order. Only Doria and the two galleasses which accompanied him were somewhat behind because they had the longest way to go. Now, preparations aboard were beginning. Decks were cleared, arms prepared along the gangways and cannons checked one last time. While the Ottoman ships were almost exclusively rowed by slaves, the fleet of the Holy League had mostly professionals or Christian convicts aboard. The former were known as valiant fighters and the latter now turned into such. Their shackles were removed and they were promised freedom in case of victory. Now that they had a common enemy, all hostilities between the men of the Holy League vanished. To the beat of the drum, the rowers pulled their oars and side by side, the galleys advanced. Around noon, the fronts of the two centers were within shooting distance. The Ottomans, still hoping to achieve quick victory, opened fire first. It was returned by four of the galleasses, which were by now in position about a mile in front of Don John's line. They thundered one hull-breaking volley after another at the lighter-armed Ottoman vessels, wreaking havoc in their first lines. According to the military historian Geoffrey Parker, this opening barrage alone sank more than 70 Ottoman galleys. The Pashas now must have certainly been cursing Karakoza Ali, who had assured them there would be no such heavy gunfire. But they had no choice. The only way, other than backward, was forward through the fire of the galleasses to get to the Christian ships and enter melee. This, they hoped, would be more promising. However, the wind that had restricted the formation of the Holy League in the morning shifted around noon and now gently blew to the east, slowing down the Ottoman advance and giving the galleasses ample time to continue their bombardment. The brutal resistance, where none had been expected, was a blow to the Ottomans. Already, the sea was fully covered with ship parts, all kinds of armament and rounding men. At this point in time, Mehmed Siroko tried to outflank the left wing of the Holy League fleet. Agostino Barbarigo, seeing what his opponent was planning, made sure that there was no gap between his ships and the shore. In perfect order, his galleys blocked away, but still some of Sirocco's men almost made it past them by venturing into dangerously shallow waters. 
Soon, the two opposing wings were interlocked with their ships so tightly packed together that they formed almost one single platform. The fighting was fierce and Barbarigo's squadrons probably would have had to give in if ships from the reserve wouldn't have come to his aid. Sirocco was determined to break through and allegedly still pushed his men forward between broken masts and shattered benches. They, however, were already leaving the severely damaged ships, trying to save themselves by swimming to the shore. Hundreds of unnamed soldiers died in the fray. After a while, Barbarigo's men were all over the Ottoman ships, cutting those who offered resistance to pieces and freeing the Christian slaves on board of the captured ships. Mehmed Sirocco himself was wounded, captured and beheaded, while Agostino Barbarigo took an arrow to the eye. At the southern end of the battle, the two remaining galleasses had in the meantime passed Doria's line and taken position. Ulu Jali, a very considerate commander, regarded by some as the most formidable seaman of his time, held back his ships when he saw what the galleasses were doing to the ships of the center. As Doria knew how skilled an opponent he was facing, the southern wings were both holding back for now. Under heavy losses, the Ottomans had finally made it past the galleasses in the center. They reformed and pressed ahead. According to the historian Lawrence Mott, quote, there was no maneuvering by either party, and the battle became one of head-on grinding attrition, end quote. Don John's galleys fired at point-blank range, exploiting the advantage of the removed prows which allowed them to shoot at the hulls of the Ottoman galleys from close, while the enemies could only aim at their rigging and the decks. Despite this, Ali Pasha and his men weren't discouraged. They sent hails of arrows and gunshots, advanced through the fire and rushed into close combat as soon as the two lines of ships clashed. Naval encounters like this had their very own rules. It was common to try to weaken the enemy from afar and then enter melee to try to board the enemy vessel. This is what happened now in the center section and had happened in the north earlier. The enemy galleys locked together in groups of two or more and their crews went for each other. It became, as one historian once called it, quote, an infantry battle on floating platforms, end quote. If the crew of one ship succeeded to board an enemy vessel, brutal fights ensued. Fighting in this manner, in the extremely confined space of the ship's deck, with rowing banks, sails and other obstacles, was vicious. The dead and wounded were tossed into the sea, where the living joined the lifeless. According to a primary account, the water was soon, quote, thick and red with blood, end quote. Amidst burning ships, ship parts and wrecked sails floated the bodies of fallen soldiers, while the wounded struggled with their lost strength. It was a scene of mayhem. As was customary, the two flagships sought each other out. After struggling through the other ships, the Real ran alongside Ali Pasha's Sultana, and their very own battle began. Ali Pasha had 300 janissaries, 100 crossbowmen and some arquebusiers on his ship, while Don John brought 400 arquebusiers. Other galleys constantly tried to help their flagships, while the fighting was going back and forth. At first, the Ottomans made it onto the Real, but after a bloody struggle, Don John's men threw them back and followed them onto the Sultana. The Janissaries, known for their unparalleled close combat skills, put up fierce resistance. Only when Marc Antonio Colonna with his flagship arrived and joined the fight did the Europeans push through. One step after another, they drove the Janissaries back and swept them off the deck. Ali Pasha himself was killed in the thick of the melee and then beheaded. When his head was mounted on a pike and a Christian flag raised on the Sultana, an outcry went through the fighting men. The men of the Holy League cheered. The Ottomans were stunned. While the fighting in the center and north went on for about two hours, in the south, Uluj Ali had turned away from the battle. He was carefully avoiding contact with the galleasses. Gian Andrea Doria also sailed south. Thanks to the galleasses, Doria succeeded to keep Ulu Jali's numerically superior force at a distance. While they were both carefully avoiding being outflanked, the two commanders slowly drifted south. However, Doria realized too late that this had a drawback too. As he was drifting south, he haphazardly exposed the right flank of the center. Ulu Jali saw his chance, turned his ships around and quickly fell in the side of the Holy League center. 
Suddenly, there was a chance the tides would turn in the last minute. Uluj Ali attacked some 15 galleys near the flagship of the Knights of Malta between the Holy League center and the right wing. Heavily outnumbered and not covered by Doria, these galleys were quickly overwhelmed. Doria now realized he had ventured too far, but it was too late. By the time he was back and the reserve arrived, the Ottomans had already killed the crews of several galleys and were rounding up more. Fortunately for Doria, the Ottoman resistance in the center had collapsed by now, so that Don John, Benier and Colonna could turn south. Uluj Ali himself was now behind the Holy League with a part of his ships, while about 60 found themselves attacked from all sides. Despite fighting a lost fight, they bravely resisted and gave the Holy League a hard time. But Uluj Ali had realized it was time to leave. By cutting the towing ropes and leaving his booty behind, he got away through the channels between Kutsilaris and Oxia. Later in the afternoon, the Ottoman fleet was entirely shattered or conquered, although isolated resistance continued until the evening. Almost 100 ships were sunk, 117 galleys captured and 3,000 prisoners taken. The Holy League had lost about 8,000 men, the Ottomans about 25,000. Only few got away. Don John abstained from pursuing them, as the day was already coming to an end and bad weather was on the horizon. Hours after the battle, the Holy League retreated to the port of Petala. Just in time, because now a violent storm mixed up the sea and swept away the glory traces of the battle. The victory over the Ottoman fleet didn't hold together the short unison of the League's commanders. Only days after, Venier sent a galley with the news of the victory to Venice without asking Don John, and the hard feelings were back. Due to the discord, the need to care for the wounded and the lasting bad weather, the Holy League fleet didn't follow up on its victory but returned to Messina. Most historians agree that the Battle of Lepanto was mainly won by the Holy League because of the favorable circumstances and their superior firepower. Contemporaries, in contrast, saw the victory as a miracle. In their eyes, Don John and his fleet had triumphed over an undefeatable enemy and saved the West from certain doom. Modern historians are more critical. The mythical and symbolic significance of Lepanto are much greater than the actual historical impact. Indeed, the Ottoman advance was stopped. Indeed, an Ottoman navy had suffered a total defeat. And indeed, the nimbus of Ottoman invincibility was broken. But the Holy League didn't capitalize on its success. It fell apart only two years later. And the Ottomans recovered quickly. Sure, they didn't dominate the Mediterranean after Lepanto as before, but generally speaking, Lepanto had altered the balance of power in the Mediterranean only little. The Grand Vizier, Sokolu Mehmed Pasha, allegedly said to the Venetian ambassador a month after the battle, quote, You may have trimmed our beards at Lepanto, but we have taken an arm from you by conquering Cyprus. A chopped off arm is lost forever, but a shaved beard grows back even stronger. <laughs>